hockey. Both teams anxious. Shoot that thing! Yet aggressive. team scored through the first half of period one until Mel Bridgman's diving shot and Dennis Potvaz's unexpected assist welcomed the Spectrum audience to the Stanley Cup Finals with a gift goal. The Flyers had taken a 1-0 lead on a weak shot. New York goaltender Billy Smith appeared to have smothered. But Potvaz inadvertently pushed the puck under Smith's body and referee Andy Van Helleman was right there to make the call. After a power play score by Mike Bossy gave the Islanders a one-all tie, Potbat decided it was time for him to put the puck in the other goal. He took a centering pass from Clark Gillies and skillfully redirected the puck off his skate and onto his stick to give New York a two-to-one advantage right in the city of brotherly love. The lead didn't last as the Flyers answered with two goals of their own. But they could not make their 3-2 lead stand up either. With less than four minutes left in regulation time and the Islanders on a power play, Flyer Bill Barber lost his stick, thereby creating a virtual five-on-three. Stefan Pearson slipped into the slot, and for the second time on the night, an Islander defenseman lit up the red light. The contest was tied 3-3. Throughout the year, these two teams have played to a standstill, both winning two games by identical scores. Now it would take sudden death overtime for one to gain the upper hand. Play was even until Jimmy Watson clotheslined John Tinelli, who would have been in all alone for an open shot. As in the semis with Minnesota, the Flyers were taking a lot of penalties. Could they afford such liberties against the Islanders? For an incredible third time, a New York defenseman moved into the slot and scored. Again, it was Potva who ended the struggle with the first overtime power play goal ever in the Cup Finals. Having the man advantage in the overtime period was quite something unusual, and we felt that if we could go and, and press the Flyers, things had developed. What happened was that uh, the puck went into the far corner opposite my point. John Tinelli got a hold of the puck and had full control of it behind the Flyer net. And as I moved in, I yelled at John Tinelli for the pass. He laid a beautiful pass to me, and all I had to do really was hit the net with the puck, and uh, that ended the game and made a lot of people happy, especially myself. It gave the Islanders a playoff record of five overtime wins. The Flyers left the ice having also lost the home ice advantage they had worked so hard to achieve. Only one second had remained on Watson's costly penalty. But this second was time enough for a Stanley Cup first. The next day it was back to practice for the Flyers. Short passes. Do two, two, and one here to start. With both teams so evenly matched, Quinn new strategy in goaltending would indeed play an even more important role. Yep. Nice and looks for the top corner coming off the wing. Likes to try and put it up in here. Every Adender player was discussed at length, and the mistakes of the previous game were analyzed. Hey, he can really take off. Well, well we didn't go to the net at all last night, uh, partially because they did a good job of putting us wide. So Quinn worked on having the Flyers drive to the front of the net. Right up. Too long. Continue on through for the shot. It worked as Paul Holmgren and the rest of the Rat Patrol line heeded their coach's words. The Flyers bore down on the Islanders' defense, driving toward the net and applying the kind of pressure that had been lacking in game one. One man that needed no prodding was Bobby Clark. He was one of a handful of flyers that had sipped from the cup in 74 and 75. Thirsting for more, Clark and his teammates applied a head-on assault on the Avender net. Bob Kelly scored his first goal of these playoffs, and Clark's four playoff points on the night would give him 101, third best among active leaders. Ryan Croce, the Avenger scoring leader, finally ended a string of four unanswered Philadelphia tallies, converting a rebound and inching him closer to the all-time single-year Stanley Cup scoring title. But with scrappy 
Jeffy Kenny Linsman barking the signals, the Flyers resume their onslaught. Linsman fed Paul Holmgren a perfect pass for his third goal of the contest. It was Holmgren's first hat trick ever and the first time in the Cup Finals that a United States born hockey player had achieved such a feat. With an 8-3 win, Philadelphia had regained their competitive edge and were anxious for the trip to Long Island. series knotted at one, play resumed two days later at the Nassau Coliseum for game number three. Islander fans were quite confident. Philadelphia had three power play chances in the first period, but three times Billy Smith frustrated them. Flyers still had the man advantage when Bob Bourne stole the puck and directed a breakaway pass to Lauren Hennig. Henning had only to beat Phil Meir, who was starting his first game of the finals. A hard slap shot deflected off Meir's pass. This was the Auditor's seventh shorthanded goal in the playoffs, beating the Rangers' year-old record of six. The goal had to be a great psychological lift, especially after the drubbing they had sustained in Philadelphia. Furthermore, New York's physical play was taking its toll on the Flyers as Paul Holmgren and blue liner Jimmy Watson both went down with injuries. The Auditors put their feared power play back into swing. They were on the verge of blowing this game apart and forward Mike Bossy said they owed it to their incredible power play. The power play worked the way it worked in the first game. We weren't getting that many shots, but the shots that we were getting were right on target. You know, we don't have a power play where we have one set play. No, and they showed the Flyers the difference, exploding for five consecutive power play goals as the Flyers fell 6-2 to two in the game and 2-1 to one in the series. Still, Islander coach Al Arbor remained cautious. The both clubs are a little similar. They're good skating clubs, a lot of offensive strength. When they're on their game like they were the other night, and we were on our game like we were tonight, anything can happen. There also was an air of unpredictability to the Stanley Cup luncheon as the gathering waited to hear the selection for Coach of the Year. In his first full year, Pat Quinn won the very award Al Arbor received last year. Being from outside the organization, and I believe you could ask players throughout the league, if there was one organization that typified the word team, uh, they'd probably say the Flyers. This first place team didn't rely on any one man. Not one of them was amongst the 25 leading scorers. Such was their balance. However, the Auditors had finished at the NHL's hottest club, and in this series, their architect, general manager Bill Torrey, thought early leads a main reason for blowouts the two previous games. Last night, we got a shorthanded goal, which really picked us up, and then our power play started to work. So uh, I think in any playoff game, emotion is a very, very important factor. Emotions remained high for game four with everyone participating. <laughs> then with the auditors having the man advantage, flyer defenseman Mike Busnick succumbed to New York's score checking. Clark Gilley stole the puck and sent it across to Mike Bossy for an easy goal. After the team's traded scores, New York put on the pressure. Fiery Gary Howitt raced up the ice, Bad Brian Trotche, and according to Islander winger Bob Nystrom, changed the course of the game. That turned us right around, it really did. It was a good second effort going down the wing by him, and he set up Trotche. It was just a big turning point. It's been said before that Gary comes up with the big plays, and he goes out there, and he's a far plug for it, and tonight he certainly was. At that point, trailing 3-1, to one, the Flyers could have rolled over and played dead. But instead, they garnered all their pride, all their talent, slipping a cross-ice pass between two Islanders for a breakaway. Kenny Lindstrom's goal drew the Flyers to within one and upset the Islander crowd. Just when it seemed the Islanders were ready to fall, they calmly cooled themselves down and went to work. First, Nystrom scored. Then Clark Gillies. 
on his way to a three-point game, broke up the wing and iced the contest. New York had earned a hard-fought 5-2 triumph for a 3-1 lead in the series. Only Toronto in the 1942 finals had come back from a deficit this great. But Brian Trotche knew the lure of the cup often brought out the best in a team. This was by far the hardest game we've played against the Flyers. Uh, let people say there was no emotion out there tonight. I'm drained. And I'm sure they are too because they played a hell of a game. In this Philadelphia arena, they had been called the Broad Street Bullies. But for Game 5, intimidation would matter little. The Flyers had an uphill climb, but their fans never gave up hope. Flyers in seven, man. They're going to take it all. Because it's destiny. Why? Could Why? have been. It could kill them. Of course, us. The Flyers. It's not all over. you got to have faith in your team. It's my team. They're going to win. Philadelphia had their backs to the wall, and the Spectrum crowd gave them a rousing standing ovation, especially after learning that Holmgren and Watson would again see action. In their eight-year history, the Islanders had been unable to win the big one. All right, gents, good luck to both of you. Let's go. Tonight would test the fortitude of the two best teams in hockey. Officiating hockey is the toughest of all sports, both mentally and physically. But referee Wally Harris keeps the contest under control with a firm hand. This win tonight, we hope we have tightened their cheeks up a little bit. New York returned home, leading three games to two. The Flyers were riding an emotional crest. Could the Islanders turn the tide again? Philadelphia scored the game opener, but then the Islanders tied it up on a controversial play. Netminder Pete Peters stopped a Mike Bossy shot. On the ensuing rebound, Dennis Potvab brought a stick high in the air, but made contact with the puck below his shoulder for a valid goal. The Auditors established a new postseason record with 14 power play goals, while Brian Trotche's assist gave him the all-time single-year playoff scoring title. With the game tied 1-1, Clark Gillies dropped a pass behind the blue line to Butch Goring. But the official missed the offside call, allowing play to continue. Seconds later, Wayne Sutter gave the Islanders the lead. To Islander fans, it was a goal. And that was all that mattered. With his knee braced and heavily taped, 
Paul Holmgren fought through three auditors to help give the Flyers renewed life. Passing to Brian Kropp, who ties the game. Now 2-2. It was a brand new hockey game, but it didn't stay that way for long. New York took the play to the Flyers in the second period, out shooting Philadelphia 12-6 with all-out hustle. Come on, boys. Let's go, you well do. do a job on Richmond, baby. culminated with two goals, one by Nystrom, and this one from Mike Bossy. Down four to two going into the third, Bobby Clark and the Flyers refused to quit. They fashioned a furious rally, started by a long Bob Daly slap shot. And capped five minutes later on a deflected blast that bounced off John Paddock's skate right into the net. From a two-goal deficit, the Flyers have come back to tie the game for a second time. Fourteen more minutes of frantic hockey follow. Each team trying to get the better of the other. But these two tired teams would face sudden death overtime. Now, one shot, one mistake, could win or lose it all. The stage is set. Ropes are dry. Who will be the hero? From now on, it's do or die. brace themselves for what could be agony or ecstasy. The pounding pressure continued through seven minutes of extra play. Each team trying to unnerve the other until... Islanders number 10, Hennig. To Tonelli. Here's Tonelli with Nystrom. A pass to Nystrom. Fighting off a choke label for the past four years, the Islanders finally had hockey's ultimate prize. One swift motion had ended 40 years of Stanley Cup drought in the state of New York. There was the joy of the winners. The veteran hero consoling the dejected rookie goalie. But most of all, there was the cup. It is like no other feeling in professional sports. All these players grow up, dreaming someday of skating around the rink with a Stanley Cup hoisted high in victory. And this was the team that had had many memorable contributions from all. I'm glad it's over! Billy Smith had been there since the beginning. All right! Unsung hero John Tinelli. We won the Stanley Cup this year as a team, and that's with a capital T. Mike Bossy had scored more than 50 goals for the third straight year. Bob Nystrom was the man in the clutch. Clark Gillies ruled the corners. Rookie Ken Morrow had won Olympic gold in the Cup all in three months. Dennis Potbat was their leader and Butch Goring their added touch. Thanks, guys! Thank you, one and all, guys! And Brian Trotche was awarded the Conn Smythe Trophy as the playoffs' most valuable performer. But the word team had spelled their success. With it came the taste of champagne for the 1980 Stanley Cup champions, the New York Islanders. begins October 5th. I love to see that. Look at the stick handling. Here he is in. He scores! NHL on the fly final. 
premieres October 5th on the NHL Network. You're watching the NHL Network. Hotels.com. We know hotels inside and out. A special inside the game, and as someone once said, it was a moment when kids all over Long Island put down their gloves and picked up a hockey stick. There are few things that compare. It's hitting a home run to win the World Series. It was an epic moment in sports. It was Bobby Nystrom's goal that won a Stanley Cup. I dreamt about it uh, and thought about it uh, a lot. I mean, even to the, from the standpoint of, of being a hero, you know, like being a police officer or a fireman or saving somebody. I mean, I always wanted to be a hero. So when, when you're put in that situation, um, you know, it, it's, it's a thrill of a lifetime. We were pretty down. I mean, we really were down after the third period because we were congratulating each other after the second. I personally went back into the uh, stick room. I always used to sit in there. And, you know, the funny thing was I went and bored a scalpel. And I tell the story, people think I'm crazy, but I was just sitting in there just kind of biding the time, you know, like it's very tough to just sit, you know, and just wait. So I was in there and I was actually carving, a, a, you know, just a chunk out of my, my stick. And I said, you know, this is going to be my winning goal. I'm going to win this. And I'm sure that everyone else thought the same thing because that's kind of the attitude that we have. And then I heard in the locker room, who's going to be the hero? And that was another thing that always happened. Who's going to be the guy that's going to win it? And everyone would chime in, hey, I'm going to win it. I'm going to win it. I'm going to win it. You know, we believed that we were going to win. And you know what? Uh, we always had a saying, hell bent for leather. Let's go at him. Let's get this over with. Maybe it didn't slow down, it's just that, that I thought of so many things before the puck even came to me as to what I was going to do with it. Tonelli, the oh, man, the thought went through my head. Thank God I didn't deke, you know, I probably would have lost it. <laughs> when I saw it deflect and I saw that it was going up high, it seemed like Pete, Peters was a little bit slow to react. I think he thought Johnny T might was maybe going to shoot. And I could watch it and I saw it. And I said, this definitely is going to go over him. And I knew that it was going in. As soon as the puck went in, I heard. And in looking at photographs after the fact, you could see the fans behind the net where the camera angle was, where they were kind of up, up, and then they were up. And then I could just hear them pounding on the glass. beautiful things about overtime is that when the puck goes in the net it's done they can't come back they, you know the game is over and that was my feeling at that time and then you know the exhilaration when I saw the boys coming and uh, to congratulate me then it was uh, you know exhilaration and happiness and man we got this monkey off our back Tonelli, the nice one. He it allowed me to give my teammates something that they always wanted you know and, and believe me, it, I, I always consider myself a journeyman player and a you know, blue collar, hard work, and, and I rode their coattails a lot. And it was an opportunity for me to give them a goal that bought the Stanley Cup. And I've heard a million uh, things about where people were when I scored that goal. So, I mean, it just changed my life that way. People remember me here. Um, Probably more so than, than a lot of other players, and, and for that I'm very thankful.